208 million people. It's the approximate number of adults in the United States that regularly use the internet. It's 84% of our adult population. And that number jumps to a staggering 96% when you only consider young adults, ages 18 to 29. Now, that's just US Census data. It's not that fascinating on its own. But what it means is something profound. What it shows is that we live in a time where each of us, all of you, have this almost infinite resource of information just available at your fingertips. And this is made even greater by the fact that it's not just information. It's resources and opportunities to embrace technology and integrate it into your community. Good evening, or afternoon, if it's your preference. My name is Mason Wildy. I'm a sophomore uh, studying computer science from the University of Kansas. And I'm also the CEO and founder of Dextella Company, a small nonprofit that focuses on producing prosthetic devices for families in need. I started this company back during my junior and senior years of high school after a series of both fortunate and unfortunate events. And it's really opened my eyes to the ways that you can use technology to improve your community. And it's also allowed me to grow as a person in ways that I would have never expected. It's let me lead, it's let me manage, I've gotten an introduction to business and entrepreneurship, I've gotten to communicate with people, form interpersonal relationships, and get that taste of engineering that I would have never gotten any way else. And it's been a crazy ride. But my experience isn't unique. There are hundreds if not thousands of people across this nation doing incredible things that would both humble and amaze the best of us. But their experiences don't have to be unique either. As I've already mentioned, we all already have these resources and these opportunities waiting at our fingertips. We just need to tap into them. And that, that's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to tell my story. I want to talk about how I went from being a sophomore, junior, senior in high school to a sophomore in college giving a TEDx speech. But I want to focus on my failures. I want to focus on the mistakes I made along that journey and focus on what I learned so that I can give that out to you guys so maybe the things that I had to learn the hard way you can just take for granted and go out on your life. So my story, what is my story? Well, for me, it really began at a very young age because I've always been a tinkerer. I've always had kind of that engineering heart. I grew up fixing motorcycles and cars with my dad, playing video games on my grandparents' computer, building Lego sets and disassembling furniture with toolkits that I was quickly restricted access to. <laughs> I've always been techie, for lack of a better word, but the spark that really moved me towards using technology to improve communities didn't come actually until my junior year of high school during a Friday night football game of all places. You see, I played safety. And if you're familiar, the job description of a safety is a lot of fast, open field hits. And I've given a lot of them and taken a lot of them in my career. But one night in the mid-October during my junior year, I gave one of those hits and it did not agree with me. And during halftime, I was carted off to a hospital and quickly diagnosed with a pretty severe concussion that took me out of school for over a month and ended my contact sport career. And initially, this was devastating to me because I loved football. I loved basketball, and I could still run track, but two-thirds of my athletic career were just cut. They were gone. Now, I was exceptionally lucky to find a wonderful concussion specialist, and she's out here somewhere. But she helped me make amazing recovery within just the first two weeks. I was regaining a lot of my basic function. I still couldn't do school, though, because of light and noise and just you know, general mental stra strain. So I was still confined to a dark room, really just staring at a ceiling, trying to sleep away the concussion. It was really just a dark time. But that's when opportunity came knocking for me. See, one of my mother's friends and coworkers had a son who was born with amniotic band syndrome which, is, if you're familiar again, is a congenital disease or disorder where you're basically born um, potentially without parts of limbs. In this case, his right hand's function was severely limited as he didn't have essentially any fingers on it. And he'd grown up very well adapted to this condition. He was able to do a lot of things that no one would ever expect him to be able to do with that. But there were still obstacles that he couldn't overcome with essentially just one fully functional hand. So they were looking for a prosthetic. Now, prosthetics are really expensive. I mean, that's just from the get-go. And he's a kid, so he's growing. So you might need to buy more than one in the course of a couple years. So suddenly, that gets really expensive. And it just wasn't feasible. And add on top of that, that prosthetic devices don't look cool. And when you're in elementary school, cool is kind of king. You've got to be cool. 
So they had found RoboHand, which was an Australian company that was building an open source 3D printable prosthetic hand. And they loved it. It looked kind of like Legos. He really liked the look of it. It was fully mechanical, didn't need electronics. They wanted to get this hand. The problem was that RoboHand was still a very small organization. And most of the production in the US, at least, was being done by third parties who also wanted a lot of money to build these hands. But that's where I came in. I had a lot of newfound downtime, and they knew me in the past from helping them with computer issues and video games with their other kids, and they knew me as kind of that engineering type. And this was right up my alley. And with the beauty of open source, I could take these files and do whatever I wanted with them. So I downloaded the files, I downloaded the programs that allowed you to edit these files, and I modified them to fit the kid's hand. And it took a week and a half of kind of 10, 20 minute increments of work where I could just focus while my head was good, take a break when I got tired, and it was beautiful. I was still taking my downtime, I was still recovering, but I was actually being able to do something. So I got these files done, I knew what I needed, but now I needed to print them, and I lived in Lewisburg, Kansas, which if you're familiar with the area is kind of rural, and where was I gonna find a 3D printer? Well, it turns out the Johnson County Library has a makerspace with a public 3D printer just 30 minutes from my home. You gotta go to your libraries, they're very understated. But <laughs> they were also a little bit ahead of me in realizing that embracing technology could improve communities. So I gave them a call, I went up there with a flash drive of files, and in basically no time, I was leaving with a bag of PLA plastic hand parts. It was way too simple. But then I went to a hardware store, I picked up some nuts and bolts, ordered a sheet of orthopedic plastic which could be molded into a gauntlet, some nylon strings for the mechanism, and it was kind of just time to build. And this seemed like it should be one of the harder parts. It was actually the easiest part because after staring at a set of designs for a week and a half, you kind of know how they're gonna fit together, and it becomes a lot like Legos, where you're just kind of plugging them where you need, they, they need to go. And within a couple hours, we had a working hand. And within probably five seconds of putting it on, the kid was already grabbing a water bottle and using it. And then he grabbed a pencil and was learning to write with that. And as I later learned, he learned he could play stickball with it. Not holding a bat, but actually using the hand as a bat, which led to me needing to do some repairs in the near future. <laughs> but he was doing incredible things with it. And it had all worked. It was remarkably smooth. And that was it. Project was done, school was starting back up, my uh, medical clearance on my concussion was about to come up, track season, life was gonna go back to normal. I'm up here talking to you guys, so clearly that didn't exactly happen, life didn't exactly go back to normal. So I mentioned my concussion specialist. She really loved that I was doing something with my time other than just sitting in a dark room, staring at a ceiling. She loved that I was going out and doing something to help someone else with this downtime. And she had formed a contact with a Kansas City Star reporter. And that, kind of le and that led to a front page article, which then kind of procured coverage with KCTV5 and Fox 4 News, a bunch of online news articles picked up the story, and it all culminated with two articles in separate editions of People Magazine. So this small project that I kind of just started on a whim with a concussion, suddenly had become this very large thing that a lot of people were taking notice of. And people were calling my school, and they were sending letters because that's the only way they knew how to contact me. It mentioned that I was a student there. And they were sending me money to help my cause. I didn't have a cause. <laughs> I was just thinking about track season. So I quickly realized that I needed to do something. I couldn't just keep going and maybe like, okay, I could have just pocketed the money and run. They didn't know me, but that wouldn't have been the right thing to do. So I had to think about how to formalize it. And luckily, one of my classmates' mother was an accountant with some nonprofit experience, so I contacted her, and we started setting up a 501c3 Dextella company. I wrote up all the bylaws, the proper legalese, and we got it approved. So I all of a sudden had a 501c3 nonprofit Dextella company. And that's really where I am today. We've since purchased our own 3D printer, and we help people as they come in. It's not some booming industry with thousands and thousands of customers every week or month. It's people as they come. And oftentimes, we don't even need to build them the hand because we make it clear that they can build it themselves if we help them along the way. And it's been an amazing experience. But what I just did was I only hit the highlights. I only told you the good things in the smooth storyboard style of here's how everything went well. But there were a lot of pitfalls during that, especially the nonprofit side, that get left out of the stories and don't get told. But I didn't learn things from being successful and doing things I apparently already kind of knew how to do. I learned things from when I made mistakes. So that's what I wanna focus on. And there were really two kind of categories of mistakes that I made 
that I'm gonna lump all of them into for the sake of time because there's too many mistakes to count. The first of which was that I bit off more than I could chew. I'm only one person. And it's something that's easy to forget, but you can't do everything. And I was trying to run track, get prepared for prom, college applications, general high school life, and all of a sudden now, I owned a nonprofit and I was trying to build a website, file tax documents, and just market and build hands. I was spreading myself really thin. And I quickly realized that I was running into days where there would be five things to do. And if I really set my mind to it, I probably could have done three or four of them. But just the fact that there were five looming on the horizon intimidated me and I'd only get one or two done. My efficiency was dropping drastically just because of the sheer load of work I had to do. So I quickly remedied this by enlisting people that knew more about the fields than I did. I had a web developer help me with a website, and I kept my accountant friend working on the taxes and business side of things so that I could focus more on my school life and the actual, I guess, engineering side of these hands. And it worked beautifully. It quickly adapted to a point where I actually could handle it. So I kind of rectified that mistake, but it was still a mistake that had a lot of impact early on. The second mistake I made was that I overestimated my market. You see, when I was getting all these letters, these calls, all this publication, it seemed like this was this really big experience and that a lot of people cared and this was going to be big. So I formed the nonprofit and initially kind of thought, hey, this should be growing really quickly. This should be a big thing really quickly. But that wasn't the case. I kind of forgot that I was dealing in a really niche market of people that needed essentially one specific 3D printable prosthetic hand that really didn't have that big of a market. So initially, I kind of, it hit me in my own ego. I, I thought I was doing something wrong. I thought, this isn't growing quick, what am I doing wrong? And it hurt my morale. And I wasn't doing as well, again, my efficiency dropped because, uh, does this even matter? Why am I even doing this? No one seems to be caring about it. But once I kind of got past that and realized, you know what, I'm helping the people that I help, and if we could live in a world where people didn't need prosthetics, I'd go out of business, but that would be a better world. So I had to get past that. And I did, and it ultimately went well, apparently. So those were my mistakes, and I kind of gained what I would consider three pieces of knowledge from them, and a lot of them have been things that you've probably heard before, but I like to restate them because these are important things that I learned from it and that you need to remember if you try to do something similar or just apply to your general life. The first of which is to know your limits. You see, I've always lived by a mantra of kind of pushing my limits, and I love that saying, push your limits, shoot for the stars, but a lot of people interpret that to mean ignore your limits or act like they don't exist. And the analogy I'll use is running because I'm a runner and that's easy to go to for me, but I can't run a four minute mile. I can't do it. I can maybe run a seven minute mile on a good day. So if I went outside right now and tried to run a four minute mile, put on some running shoes hopefully, I would fail miserably. I would get about half a mile in at a full sprint and then collapse and crawl the rest of the way and probably end up running a nine or a 10 minute mile. If I had just started on pace for my seven, I would have run a seven. Because I ignored my limit, I did poorer in the long run. Now, if I know my limit and I train intelligently, I can go from a seven to a 650 to a 645, whittle that down, and suddenly now maybe my limit's a four minute mile. But if I just go out and run four minute miles over and over again and keep collapsing, I might get there eventually, but it's not gonna be nearly as quickly. So you gotta know your limits and you gotta train effectively with that knowledge. The second piece of knowledge, I guess, would be to do your research, and this ties directly into my overestimation of my market. Had I gone in and done my research and known everything, I wouldn't have been so blindsided by the fact that I wasn't as big as I thought I was going to be. If you go in blind, you're obviously going to be blindsided because all of your sides are blind. But you gotta do something beforehand to have a lay of the land before you go in. Another analogy would be, as a computer science guy, I'll go to apps. If I built an app that took the current date, added up all the numerical values, and then printed the square root of those, that's kind of cool, shows I can build an app. It's kind of gimmicky, but I made it. Let's say it took me a week. Does that help anyone? If I did that with the intent to help a lot of people, would it? And the answer is probably no. And that's obviously kind of an arbitrary, simple example, but. If you go into something and you think you're gonna help thousands of people and you don't do your research and realize that it's already been done, it's done a better way somewhere else, you could effectively waste a lot of time on an endeavor that you could have had better efficiency by putting your effort into another area and had a lot better result. So you gotta do your research first. 
Now, both of those pieces of information tied directly to my mistakes. They obviously would have, if I had taken that advice of myself and applied it earlier, I wouldn't have had those two mistakes most likely. The third one is probably my most cliche piece of information, but it's also the most important and applicable to everyday life, and it's to have fun. I know, it's, it's cheesy. I love the cheesiness of it, but every motivational speaker you've ever heard has told you, have fun. And if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. But it's really true. Because when I was building that hand, and when I'm working on that nonprofit stuff now, it feels like I'm back building Legos. It feels like I'm working on motorcycles. It feels like I'm playing computer games. It's all this incredible feeling of fun, and all of a sudden I look up, and it's been three hours, and it feels like it's been 30. And I put a lot of effort into this, and I have a good product. Contrast that with doing something that I'm not having fun, and suddenly I'm checking my watch every 10 minutes, wondering, all right, is this enough? Is this good enough? When can I go do something else that I actually do find fun? So you've got to find that thing that you have fun with and that you're passionate about to be that level of efficiency. And an add-on to that, it's easy to say have fun, do what you're passionate about, but what are you passionate about? That takes people a long time to answer. For me, I got lucky and it kind of got thrown on me and I realized, hey, I really enjoy this. It's hands-on building, it's fun, I love this. But my other interest, which was mentioned kind of in my introduction of AI, artificial intelligence, I didn't really know that until about a year into college. I went through two majors, two research labs, and then I kind of landed on that passion. And that's still probably kind of early, so I was lucky in two cases there. Some people might go years and years trying to find that thing that really drives them, and for me, those two things, if you ask me about them, you, I'm gonna have to ask you how much time you have because I'm gonna start talking faster, I'm gonna start rattling, I'm gonna start rambling because I'm interested in them and I want to talk about them because it's fun to me. So you gotta find those things in your life that you have fun with and embrace them and turn them into something to benefit the community. So, knowing your limits, doing your research, and having fun. That's pretty much all I got from the last three to four years of running a nonprofit. But I think it's easily applicable to anything we do in life, specifically in this field. So with that, I urge you, when you leave here, you probably have something in your mind, something you've run into in the past week, month, maybe year, where you thought, eh, that's a bit of a problem. I wish someone would fix that. You can fix it, potentially. Look into that. Let that, let that festering thought grow into an idea and embrace it. Do your research, know your limits, think if you're gonna have fun with it, and then pursue it. With that, I urge us all to go out make something, and just make the world a little bit better for it. Thank you.